What I learned um, from those days and years spent in Rwanda um, and ever since in starting the bank and in also starting a bakery were three really important lessons that I carry with me and certainly form the foundation for acumen. And the first is that dignity is more important to the human spirit than wealth. Um, so often when we hear people talk about poverty and the poverty line, it's always in dollar terms, $1, $2, $3 a day. Um, and certainly that's a component of poverty, but the real marker, the real thing that divides those who are impoverished and those who are not um, is choice and opportunity. And it's something that we need to keep in mind as we're looking at the systems that we build to really make change. The second is that traditional charity and aid alone will not solve problems of poverty. And certainly we've seen this um, over the last 50 years where um, aid does have a role to play and it has a very important role to play. But the top-down approaches of thinking, I know you, this, the answers to your problems, um, not only often doesn't work, but it can um, very often make things worse. And on, a, on the other hand, the markets alone are not going to solve uh, major problems of poverty. Certainly, if the last couple of years didn't show us that, um, nothing will. But that as we're watching even markets move people out of poverty, we're seeing an, a rising gap between rich and poor. And relative wealth is as important as absolute wealth when you're looking at the way human beings see themselves and judge themselves as to how they're doing in the world. I would go into these villages and you'd see this really big solar um, battery that nobody understood was usually broken and ended up being like a platform that kids played on. Um, and what's so exciting now is that the cost of solar has come down to a place where we can actually make it so that it's more affordable for low-income people to buy it, so they just need to substitute. And um, that's what we've done by investing in a company called D-Light. The company started uh, at Stanford, actually, by four young guys who said, we've, there's got to be a better way to get rid of kerosene. But again, they thought of the poor as customers. They didn't take this, up, this orientation that the poor won't pay, but rather, if we created something that they would value and pay for, what would it look like? This first model, the Nova, is a $36 um, solar light. And indeed, while it sold very well, um, it didn't take off like wildfire because most people couldn't afford it. And so they um, rejiggered it and they made this new one, the Kiran, which is a $10 lamp. It's about the size of a water bottle. And that little panel on the top is, is the solar panel. And the mother's just hanging it outside their houses um, in the daytime. And then at night, the, the light will, will burn all night long. And what's been interesting is that as we're doing consumer surveys, we find that lots of kids like to keep the light on all night long because um, dark villages can be scary. And um, now they have their, their lights, um, lights there as well. Uh, in the last year, they've sold 140,000 of these lights. So uh, takeoff is happening really quickly. One of the secrets to this is that there's profit all along the supply chain. So this guy, Udaiver, is one of the best secrets of D-Light. And he sells these lights and he takes a margin. And I was talking to him in front of all these guys and I said, so what are your margins? And, you know, it was almost as if I had asked him this, like, sinful question. He was like, Madam, please, you know, can I tell you this in private? And I said, sure. And, and then he said, what I will say is both my children are now in private school. Um, and so there's this huge opportunity that people want to get in. And it's a completely different story. I just want to end with a story that I started last year when I spoke here. Um, it's one of my favorite stories. And um, I think what I love most about the work I get to do is that we're always seeking, we're always learning. Um, we might not have answers to anything, but we're certainly finding a deepening of the questions. Um, and last year I talked about a woman named Jane. Um, she is a member of a, one of my favorite organizations in the world called Jami Bora. It's a nonprofit community development organization that lends to really, really poor slum dwellers in Nairobi slums. Uh, prostitutes, beggars, thugs. It really doesn't matter to Jami Bora, but they expect a lot from you as an individual. You have to put up $50 to get a $50 loan. Um, Jane had been a prostitute, um, HIV positive, moved through, built up her business first as a tailor and then making these really beautiful Sweet 16 dresses, and her dream was to buy a house. Acumen Fund had lent $250,000, quarter million dollars, um, to Jami Bora about five years ago to build what everyone thought was crazy, a, um, a 2,000 house 
uh, development about an hour outside the Nairobi slums. Um, and people said, you know, this is not what bankers typically would be going after. Um, slum dwellers with no credit record, building a housing development an hour outside of the city um, with no markets around um, for people who aren't usually the people you want to have as your neighbors. And um, last week I went back to visit th this beautiful um, housing development um, for a couple of reasons. One, the organization had actually repaid their entire $250,000 to us so that we could use it again to invest in others. Um, and then I went with Jane um, to her house. And I had been to her house the year before, and it was literally in the middle of a garbage dump, uh, open defecation, no, no um, electricity, no toilet, just a little tin box. And um, you can imagine walking into this house with two bedrooms and sunflowers growing and um, a kitchen and um, puppies. I was almost like, it's getting a little Disney, too Disney for me. You know, it's just extraordinary. And um, there was this one moment, which I will not forget as long as I live, um, because toilets have been such a big part of my life, and that sounds ridiculous, but working in slums where there are none that work and where Jane comes from, everyone uses what's called the flying toilet. Because there are no toilets available and the, 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 the only ones that are are very dangerous and expensive, the latrines, people defecate inside their home either on paper or in a bag and then they throw it onto the rooftop. And so um, Jane was showing me her kitchen and she was so proud. And then we went into the toilet, the bathroom. And first she had to um, demonstrate um, what it felt like to take a shower. Um, and then she went to the toilet and she said, you know, when you're a mother in Mathari, um, your child's always sick because the, the water's so dirty. So, the the, so my children always have diarrhea. And there's no way you can get them to the latrine. And so the only choice I, we have is flying toilets, but then it goes all over the paper and all over the floor, and I spend my day cleaning. And she said, and now I just I sit down. And she sat down, and she said, and I relax. And when I'm finished, I stand up, and I push the button, and whoosh, it goes away. <laughs> And I just burst into tears. And, and, I, and I stood there, and, and I just could feel her joy. And I realized, this is what patient capital is. This, I get it. OK, it took me 26 years. But I get it that, that in a world that's interconnected, we have a chance in some ways to go back in history. Because if you think about tribes, if you think about religions, they're inside the tribe, inside the religion, usury was, was considered a sin. You could lend to each other, you could invest in each other for each other to succeed, and it kept you close. Outside the tribe, outside the religion, you could lend at really high interest rates because it actually worked for you. It kept you distant. And in an interconnected world where we have this excess wealth, this excess resources, if we really see ourselves as one tribe, we can invest in people like Jane and in, Jam in Jami Bora, not because we're subprime mortgage guys who just want to make profit, but because we want her to succeed. And when she succeeds, she's part of the tribe too. We want her to pay us back as part of her responsibility as, and her accountability so that we can invest in others. And it's that circularity that I think, for me, provided the insight to a much more spiritual dimension of where we are in the world today, and as we see capitalism, that's the best that we have, but clearly needs changing and imagining this idea that we could actually create another asset class that operated a little differently, because you wouldn't get your money back, but you would see it moving and actually building a world that finally begins to extend that fundamental human principle that all men are created equal to every human being on this planet. And at the end of the day, I can't think of a better reason for living and a better, um, a, a better thing to be working on as a generation. Um, because I think that there's never been a time in history where that's been more within our grasp. How do you respond to people who might feel uncomfortable with sort of market-based models? How do you help us understand as, an, as, a, as a university how these really contribute? Uh, what are some of the lessons you've learned about how to do this well? Um, well, first of all, I am by no means a, mar a market yeah. ideologue. Right. Um, I think that we have gone so far the other way in, in terms of looking at poor people. Well, 
in terms of not looking at poor people, or when we do look at them, we see them as throwaways or um, very pathetic and full of despair, rather than recognizing just this enormous potential. So I start with markets because I think it's a better listening device mm -hmm. than coming in to say, I know your problems and I'm going to solve them. Um, but I do not have the, the, the arrogance to think that the market is going to solve everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. And so what I say is, use the market as a listening device to understand where we can find efficiencies mm -hmm. and what its limitations are. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, and, and where, where you, what you learn with markets as well, is that, um, yes, extreme affordability really counts, accessibility really counts, uh, so does beauty, mm -hmm. um, so does status, so does comfort, and we're really kidding ourselves, particularly in the public health. I think the public health sector is the most egregiously um, faulty mm -hmm. in the way that it speaks in shoulds. This is what people should do. And it's like, well, yeah, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So let's let, focus on what they would do if we could make this more accessible in a way they want to access right. it. Right. And I think those, that those have been really big lessons for me. Right. One thing that I was interested in in one of the examples in your book was the way you worked with ICICI in India. And it seems to me that in thinking about scaling the availability of capital for social entrepreneurship of the kind that you, um, you make available, that one of the things we have to think about is local financial systems and local capital oh, markets. Yeah. So say a little bit more about how you think that might happen, the role that you might play and others to make that happen. Um, and it's a really fine line because when you're, um, and I, I don't think anybody has the formula for it, but um, when you're trying to, to construct the financial instruments to invest in the kinds of organizations that we invest in, you've got to be soft and patient enough to allow real running room for people to experiment and fail a lot. But you've got to be tough and market-driven enough to get them to the point where they, you know that they're going to be able to escalate into more traditional capital. And so with Water Health International, um, back in 2004, we made a $600,000 equity investment. We bought shares in this startup company that was trying to bring um, UV filtered water into the rural areas using a decentralized model. So in other words, they had a, a, a plant that they would sell to a local entrepreneur. But none of the local entrepreneurs have capital. And so somehow the local entrepreneurs needed to borrow from the banks. No commercial banks had ever lent money into the water sector in rural areas because it didn't exist. So we went to ICICI and because there was this incredibly innovative guy, Nacho Kett Moore there, mm -hmm. um, we said, look, We've got the patient capital, and at that time I was even more cavalier in terms of like, we lose it, at least we've tried it. Mm -hmm. um, you lose it, your shareholders get really mad at you. And um, so we'll take 30% first loss guarantee um, on this money. But in 18 months, you need to look at the coverage ratios, the people's actual practice of paying back, and we're going to renegotiate those terms. And so um, a year and a half later, we had been so conservative that then we reduced our guarantee to 15%. Mm -hmm. And the dream is, over time, you have no guarantee mm -hmm. because they can take a guarantee on the plant itself or what have you. And that's been a huge success story on many, many levels. But um, what I learned there is now Water Health International has 300 plants serving 400,000 people. And it's actually creating an industry. And industries mm -hmm. are really important. Right. Then and there, and there was no water industry for the poor um, five years ago. So. I actually want to talk a little bit about scaling. Um, and when you think about your fund, first of all, scaling it, um, I know that you're making some efforts for that, so I'd love to hear about that. But also just, and I sound, may sound a little bit academic here, but you know, kind of your theory of change, you know, sort of like where, you know, you're, you're never going to be, I think, but you might have some aspirations for being a billion dollar fund. But, um, so, what, how, how is it that these investments in different enterprises is going to affect larger markets? How do you see that happening? So more important than acumen fund scaling, although I do think that we need to be at least a quarter billion dollar fund so that um, people really have to now? pay attention. Now we're about 45. Okay. So, but we'll be, we'll be 55 by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll, we'll cross the 100 mark in the next few years. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so, so acumen needs to scale to some level, but as you said, it's not clear just how big. Mm -hmm. 
what's more important is that the individual investments scale. Right. And my theory, of, I'm, I'm, I believe in entrepreneurship, I believe in innovation, and I believe that the, pub, the private innovation will drive a lot of the public solutions. And where we're seeing scale, and I'd say that there are, there are four that are already what we would call category breakers, mm -hmm. um, is when we start off as the little guys, a million dollar investment, um, when it gets to the point where it starts scaling, it has two roads, capital markets, mm -hmm. government. And with um, one, two, nine, and ambulances, it's been a government play. Mm -hmm. With Water Health International, government. With D-Light, it will be more likely um, a capital markets. Mm -hmm. There are risks with both um, entities big time. And I keep thinking, okay, here's the next skill set that we need to develop. On the capital markets, uh, co-investors that come in often say, this is an amazing um, company, an amazing product, but it would be so much easier if we just went up market a little bit. And that's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. And so how we mm -hmm, mm -hmm. navigate that is something that uh, certainly I'm keeping a lot of my time focused on. And with government, corruption. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big piece of how do you avoid falling into corruption and then this, the change of, of local governments right. and that, what that can do to a company. Right. How can you measure success, especially when you are so, there are so many intangibles and often partners have a business, have a business mentality and expect quantified returns. So I know you're spending a lot of time thinking about measurement and you have been committed to accountability. Say a little bit more about what Acumen is trying to do systemically around accountability and measurement. So Acumen, um, started off by looking internally at our own organization and um, came up with this, actually Brian Trostad, who's one of my colleagues, came up with this idea of BACO, the best alternative charitable option. Mm -hmm. So could we measure what it cost us on the philanthropic dollar, the dollar that wasn't coming back, and compare that to the best um, that charity was, was doing, whether it was a house or uh, a bed net um, was the easiest example where where if we, we were selling bed nets for a dollar, you still had to put a, about a $6 subsidy. Um, but when the UN was giving them away, mm -hmm. um, it was a $12 subsidy. And so there's, there's more data to be put into public policy around this. The second is just on an output basis. At some level, um, once you're at 20 million nets a year and 7,000 jobs, you're doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. not to get too ridiculously academic, mm -hmm. where you do need to get not ridiculously academic, but it, Acumen can't do it, is where we can partner with universities because it's one thing to get people in that, it's another thing to, to discover whether they're using it or not. Mm -hmm. With water, what we discovered, much to our chagrin but not surprise, is people would buy the water, they would bring it home, they would pour it into the contaminated clay pot. So while you could sell clean water, often you weren't actually getting it into people's bodies clean. Mm -hmm. And so now we're using different um, marketing tools and looking at um, different vessels um, and where you can actually do the cleaning with, you know, people could bring their own pot for cleaning mm -hmm. to try to deal with that problem. Right. So there's, we look at the different levels. Pulse, which is the platform that Acumen Fund developed with, in collaboration with a couple of other organizations, um, is now being tested by about 50 different foundation social investors mostly through Andy, and that led then to another organization called GIN, because then you get into, well, what is a job? Is a micro loan a woman selling lettuce, um, a little bit more lettuce, does that count as a job? Does a, a farmer who now is getting served a job? Um, probably not, mm -hmm. but many people count it as a job. Right. So we're really big now in that whole uh, not just quantification, but mm -hmm. clarity mm -hmm. around what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. It's really easy to, actually it's easy to take credit for everything. Um, well, and, and it's really dangerous. And exactly, and also, I mean, this is critical to, for in, if we're serious attracting about making change. more capital. And, yeah, and, and if we're serious about, right. are we creating the change that we say that we yeah. are? And if we're not, well, then we need to change the, what we're doing. Right. Um, but don't hide it because you think you're gonna get more money for it. I wanna just shift this a little bit to just about your own personal journey about. Um, a lot of people here are interested in, you know, how you started your company, how you got to, um, or your organization, Acumen Fund, and more, more of an understanding of how it, what it takes to be a social entrepreneur. What are some of the, and whether yourself or others that you've seen, what are the qualities 
that you see in people that are really necessary? And, and can people develop these, or do they have to be born to be hmm. social entrepreneurs? Um, well, first, I think it's really important to say that um, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. And I, I feel that one of the, the, the downsides in what, what's happening right now in the world is that there's kind of a, a sexiness to the social entrepreneur. Um, and so everyone thinks that they should be the social entrepreneur. But um, I'm an entrepreneur, and I live with an entrepreneur. And so hardly anything really gets done in our house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You really need people who know how to build things, who really love systems, who love rules, and, um, and or you just don't build anything. And so, and, and those are the unsung heroes of the, the social enterprise sector. We need more people to say, you know what, I want to be a builder, I want to be the architect, not I want to be the entrepreneur. I, I, used, I do think you can train some qualities into entrepreneurs, but I think that there is an entrepreneurial personality. Mm -hmm. um, Acumen is like the seventh organization that I've started. Um, from the time I was 10 or 11, and you see that mm -hmm. a it lot. Was, yeah. When you talk to Bill Drayton, he was six, and he was doing the um, school newspaper. Mm -hmm. I was selling Christmas ornaments, and I had my whole big business so that I could pay for my ski trips. You know, it was um, the kind of the, the, the scrappy, I see a problem, I want to solve it. Um, stubborn, uh, always thinking of, how can I change this? What can I do? Um, not very good with bosses. Um, <laughs> really bad with bosses, in fact. <laughs> but I do think yeah, that there's, right. they're not the easiest personalities, necessarily. Right. right. Um, and what, you know, I know you have a fellows program now that you've started, um, which I think would be good for all of you to know a little bit about what you're trying to do there in terms of building the pipeline. Of people for the yeah, field. and that's different because I, I we're not trying to create um, social entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, the Acumen Fellows Program we started um, now five and a half years ago, which is amazing, <laughs> and we take about ten people a year. We get over six or seven hundred applications from sixty-five countries typically, so it's really ridiculously competitive, and they're incredible people, aged probably twenty-five to forty-five, and um, and the idea there is to seed the field with leadership. And I think leadership can be taught. And I think leadership is ultimately what's most important, not only for the sector, but for, this, for our world. How well do you think universities are preparing their students for you know, making a difference in the world? Um, I and how would you advise us to do it better? I, I, I think that the universities um, have some catching up to do because the students are moving so quickly. And it's not the university's fault because it's a big institution. And, and, and it's exciting, and I think New School is at the cutting edge of listening. And it's that same theme. The students, you know, through technology, they know each other all around the world. There's this hunger for multidisciplinary. Don't put me in a box. I want to use these hard skills, so don't, I, I want to get these hard skills, but I want to use it to change the world. We're seeing it over and over and over. Um, that, uh, that the universities need to do a better job catching up. I would also say, and, and I'm on the um, advisory of Stanford Business School, um, and I'm connected to Harvard Business School, um, it was really striking to me after the financial crisis that many of the business schools were saying, are we to blame? And my answer was, you know, yes, frankly. <laughs> I mean, you're the ones that are producing the leaders that took this thing down. Yeah. And, the, and the reason is, but, but truthfully, because what we did as, as institutions is we allowed um, graduates to come out and think that as long as they were making the most money and they were playing inside the letter of the law, they were the winners. Mm -hmm. We're not doing enough to build leaders who say, I'm going to do the right thing. Because the world is changing so fast that these legal systems aren't even catching up with where we are. Mm -hmm. But I know what's right for the world. And in fact, I'm one of the most privileged people in the world. And it is my responsibility to do that. And so I think we need to do a little less telling our students they're so special and they're already leaders, and a little more telling them that leadership is a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. And it is hard. Um, and what's expected of them. And giving them the tools and the networks um, that, that are not only multidisciplinary, but that are deeply moral in an exciting 
way, not a mother superior way.